Good morning. Um, J.P. Michaels is a, a recent PhD at Florida State University in COEPS. And uh, I'm going to, uh, first I have to ask him, which button, do, oh, I push, I know, do, yeah, I got it, yeah, right. So uh, I'm gonna say something to upset some of you. Those of you who know me are not gonna be surprised. Uh, the ocean and the atmosphere move. So why would you use stationary EOFs? EOFs have no physics. So what I'd like to date today is to uh, uh, show you using ENSO data to demonstrate a, an idea which I think is new. Uh, at least I've searched the literature and can't find any reference to using quaternions uh, to get uh, coherent patterns out of data. The, uh, and uh, went one too far. Now, click on this. Huh? No, it's not working. The movie isn't. Anyway, if you, if this show, can you click on the movie? Okay. It's done. Now, just click on the arrow and it go. Click on the movie. No, you went back. And then click the arrow on the bottom. So this is, a, this is an animation of sea surface, uh, uh, temperature from a Gulf Stream thing, just as an example. And I was going to put a movie of something about the atmosphere moving, but you see it all the time on television. So I'm going to go to the next one. So uh, basic EOFs is to, to calculate the coherence uh, or, or correlation matrix, covariance matrix, and split it into its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And I might introduce one thing here. As far as I know, uh, the rest of the scientific community in the world that uses this technique never, hardly ever uses the term EOFs. It's very, uh, if you go talk to people using this technique in other fields, you find out they like to call them PCAs instead of EOFs. Uh, so here's a simple example. The data is on the left side. It's a non-stationary pattern, time uh, on the x-axis and uh, the uh, amplitude on the on thing. And when you use this classic EOF, you get the pattern back. Okay, now here's another pattern. It's, on the left-hand side is uh, a, a moving pattern uh, in time. And if you use the standard EOF, you get uh, all kinds of other things which have in the literature now, everybody's searching in the residual uh, data in the Pacific to name other kinds of, uh, you know, ENSOs. Uh, and you obviously are missing something. If you try to use the standard uh, EOF with propagating signal. Now, every, the ones who, people in the audience who know about this know there is something called propagating EOFs, which I, or complex EOFs. And if you, you say, that's the, uh, did I go, uh, what am I, oh, I gotta go back. So uh, it, this is what, if you have a, prop, a propagating pattern and uh, you use the, uh, uh, no, that's what, that's this is the EOF with the propagating signal. I'm, Okay, so we solved, the pro I got we solved the problem with complex EOS where we put our data in the real part of a complex array and the, Hil and the Hilbert transform in the imaginary part and Hilbert transform, if you look at it in the, on, in, in the textbooks and on Google, you'll find that uh, it seems very complicated but actually it's very trivial. You basically uh, shift each Fourier mode in the data by 90 degrees and put them together and the nice thing about that is, and it's been published by many people using different data, is now all of a sudden you can get, besides you can get amplitude, you get group velocity, everybody knows what group velocity is, right? And phase velocity of whatever propagating structure is there. Uh, here's an example, it's a moving pattern, uh, just a one-dimensional pattern, and when you do the propagating EUFs, you can see that the, it comes out over here as the, the, the you re recover the pattern. Okay, but that's just a scalar feel. So what happens if you have, if you have a vector field, uh, then you can also uh, break it up. Uh, and I went, went too far here, I'll oh, start going back. So uh, what I'm trying to do today is, uh, you know, what, sometimes people want to look at the covariance of two different variables using EOFs. So what I'm going to actually choose to, to do is take the uh, sea surface temperature anomalies across the Pacific from the equator to New Guinea and uh, I'll show you the, 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 and in time over many years. Uh, and I'm gonna use the east-west wind stress and the sea surface temperature anomalies. So I have two scalar variables 
and I want to look for propagating, so I need to have to use the, the um, Hilbert transform on both of the data. And uh, to do that, I need something new. And the new thing is quaternions. Uh, now, most uh, physicists will tell you they use it a lot in theoretical physics. I've searched the literature. I kind of find it. Think about quaternions as a four-dimensional uh, vector uh, where we have an i, j, k that's orthogonal to each other. And uh, the i, j, k act like imaginary operators. And then uh, i times j is k and so forth. It's non-commutative, but so basically what we're going to end up doing eventually is showing you when east-west wind stress will be one variable and SST will be the other variable, and we'll see to get a propagating structure out of the data. So here's a simple example again like the other ones. Uh, now we have, uh, let's call it the east-west velocity on uh, the left side and the north-south velocity on the other, so, but the amplitude is slightly different between the two components, and when we do the Quaternions, uh, we, the first mode captures almost all the structure, but there's some little pieces it doesn't capture. But certainly, you would, if you found that in your data, you would conclude it. So here's the real data. East-west wind stress from 5 north to 5 south uh, from 1980 to 2010 uh, it, using FSU winds on a two-degree grid. And, um, the, uh, and it goes, like I said, from about the... Uh, uh, New Guinea to, uh, to, to the Galapagos, and the SIT anomalies are from what we call the Reynolds data, and I think it has a more modern name these days, and over the same grid. So this is just a still now, having done the, this from the first quaternion mode, and uh, I've, I'm going to show you two stills. This is just a particular month. It happens to be in December uh, 1989. I can't read it up there right now. And you can see there's arrows on it. The arrows are the east-west wind stress. The, con the white contours are the magnitude of the wind stress. And the colors are the sea surface temperature anomalies. Uh, and then the, in the second mode, um, it's going to be a standing mode, just a tilt mode, and with the same kind of thing. So I'm going to show you two animations if I'm lucky enough here. Now, would you, sir, would you put your up there and click on the picture? Now, go, now run it, please. OK. So, this is, this is just covering the 97, 98 uh, El Nino, La Nina event. And uh, I think that the results confirm most people's ideas, this big event. Now, sir, would you run it again? So, so as the, when the winds become, anomalies become from the west, you get warm water. And when the, the, it changes over to uh, uh, negative, um, See, so temperature anomalies, you get the warm water. Okay, I'm going to go. That's the first mode. And then the second mode, click on it, please, sir. The second mode isn't propagating at all. So if you use quaternions and you only have stationary modes that are statistically significant, you will get them. Get them. It, everything doesn't have to propagate. Run it again to, when it finishes. So it's just a tilt for most of the amplitude across the whole basin. OK. Now, I remember, this is only one ENSO event in that period from 1980 to 2010. We have the whole thing. But I just for this purpose, I just want to show this one particular example. So my conclusions are, don't use standard EOF analysis for air and ocean data, OK? For one variable, you can use the propagating EUFs or, like a, or what we call complex EUFs. For two variables, get a smart physicist to help you use quaternions. Because I've asked a lot of you, and you never heard of them. Uh, it's not hard. It's just, it's just linear deconstruction. So we know ENSO is a couple air-sea interaction from theory. Using quaternions, we can illustrate the coupling between wind and sea. The first mode is ENSO, and the second mode is a stationary east-west tilt mode, no movement. And these first two modes capture 80% of the variance in the database. Um, I had restricted it to a small equatorial thing. It, obviously, if you went to a, like from 30 north to 30 south, it would pick up off equatorial physics and it wouldn't count for that much variance. Uh, and uh, th there is one paper by co my colleague, Dr. Alkos, uh, that is published where he was looking at, he didn't actually run data on it, but he did a lot of the algebra. And then lots of people have done the propagating EUFs. And I'm uh, just to say, one we did a long time ago, 
looking at finding Rossi waves off the coast of California, but there's a lot of other literature. If you want the PowerPoint to look at this carefully, uh, get the thing called Dropbox and email me. And I guess if you can't find my email, then uh, you don't get it. Uh, any questions? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the, I did not make a physical interpretation uh, on it, but I would I basically uh, guess is that uh, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the the equatorial waves bouncing back and forth, you know, uh, they uh, they it tends to amplitude on each end. Okay, so that doesn't come out with the very simple back and forth movement of the of the big event. Okay, so it's, because it's right near the boundaries. So it's like a you know a tilt across the whole basin on a longer on a longer little slightly longer time scale. Any more questions? Thank you. First two modes account for 80% of the joint variance of the two variables. It's just noise left over. Okay. Uh, accounting those first two modes, counting the big one, and I don't. I was trying to remember last night. I don't remember how the two separated. Yeah, yeah. The first one is much bigger. Um, well, uh, no, but I'll just tell the audience. If you did a standard EOF of this. What you would do is you would put the, um, the SST in one part of your matrix and the uh, winds in the other matrix, and you have to scale them. The data you actually put in is not just anomalies, it's actually you know, normal deviates. That's important to know, because they're different dimensions, right? They're normal deviates. That, yeah. Now, okay, now here's, a, let me, one more second, and that, that is that, uh, so what if I wanted to go back to the old paper uh, that was looking at 200 millibar winds, and I want to compare it to the, the winds down below over the equator, right? So now I got four, I have now four scalar variables, right? U and V upstairs and U and V downstairs. What do I do? You go to a new kind of matrix that has eight components, okay? Octaternions. You cannot find that one in the literature. You heard it first. 